thank you very much for joining us and welcome to the ITBA 2022 Autumn Winter Vet Series. Um, my name is Hannah Marks and I'm the Education Coordinator here with the ITBA. Um, we're delighted to welcome to everyone online. Um, I know it's pretty miserable in Ireland at the moment, so it's great that we are able to run these. We're hosting a wide range of attendees tonight from Norway, Sweden, Denmark, South Africa, New Zealand, France and the UK. Um, and many thanks to Kerry Ryan from the EFTBA for helping set it up as well. And of course, our two speakers tonight, Dr. Emma Adam from the Gluck Equine Research Centre and Sharon O'Regan from Weatherby's for giving us their time this evening. Um, if any attendee would like to avail of the CVE credits with Veterinary Council Ireland and hasn't already let me know, can you please drop me an email after the seminar so we can record your attendance? And before I welcome the speakers, as I mentioned earlier, can I ask all participants to make sure that their mics are muted? Um, but we'd love if, if you kept your video on as it really, like, it's great to interact with everyone on screen as well. Um, I'd now like to welcome our first speaker, Dr. Emma Adam, who will talk about the novel rotavirus B detected in outbreaks of neonatal foals in 2021 and 2022. Dr. Emma works at the Gluck Equine Research Center, Kentucky, where her job includes research, outreach, and liaison to the equine industry. So Emma, you're good to go there with everything shared on screen. So if you wanna take it away. Thank you very much indeed for the invitation to share the work of so many people in my area. And, um, and uh, very much thanks to you, Hannah, Des, and Ina for sorting it all out. So I'd like to share some collective work done uh, in central Kentucky, where we were examining rotavirus. And then we had some, uh, some issues last year, which just turned into a completely new strain. So this is indeed a, a very significant team effort. Uh, as you can see here, it's, it's vets, it's studs, it's researchers, it's pretty much everybody in the industry where we're all pulling together on this one. So as everybody probably knows, rotavirus is a ubiquitous pathogen causing diarrhea in humans and agricultural animals, mostly young animals. We tend to lose our ability and we're realizing that's to do with a, a molecule on, a, on the surface of our gut that may make us less prone to this disease as we get older. But it is nevertheless still the cause of uh, about 500,000 human deaths per year and the biggest enteric pathogen in humans across the globe. Typically, we've always talked about rotavirus and what we've actually meant in horses is rotavirus A. That is until now. And the what we see with the different rotavirus families, and there are nine groups here, and those groups are essentially based on this VP6 molecule in the capsule, um, is essentially that we see those nine groups and there is not that much, um, there's very specific group immunity that is engendered by being infected with these different these different groups of viruses. So we're all pretty used to looking at sort of these diagrams of viruses these days, and they don't necessarily mean that much. But I will point out just a couple of things on this one. The first is that it is a very resistant virus because it doesn't have a capsule. So unlike a lot of viruses that have a capsule, we can wash our hands with detergent and we can really inactivate them. Rotavirus is quite hard to inactivate. The other thing I will point out is while we have focused on the VP7 type, which we talk about G3 and G14, particularly with type A rotaviruses, and I'll get into that. I would say that there is a lot of work emerging that we're going to start hearing more about these P types. In horses at the present time, we only have P12, but it looks like the difference between these P types could be a significant key to generating useful vaccines. So a little bit about rotavirus pathology, we're pretty much all very familiar with the fact it causes diarrhea. It likes to invade the mature villous tips of the small intestine, as you see here on this scanning electron micrograph. On the left-hand side of this image, you can see a normal small intestine with these finger-like projections. And here on the right-hand side, you can see what happens after significant damage, massive blunting, reduction of surface area. So that surface area is important for absorption and for digestion because covered over this villus is where all of the enzymes, many of the enzymes for digestion take place, particularly lactase, which digests the predominant milk sugar lactose. So we get a massive loss 
of the ability to digest and to absorb. And those obviously then create the situation where we have undigested, particularly milk sugars, and they have an osmotic effect, and they're going to be pulling water into the gut, making a much larger volume of undigested material in the gut. And that undigested material creates the perfect environment for an overgrowth opportunity. And for those, we often think about organisms such as Clostridium perfringens and its cousins. But the gut gets very inflamed. And so that um, also causes an ileus where the gut doesn't really move and these small intestines are just sitting there. Uh, they're not really moving food along. They're pretty unhappy. And we all know that that then causes distension of the bowel and, um, and an inability to move things along. And so these foals can get pretty unhappy. But what we also now see, and it's only been demonstrated in rodent models, is there could actually be a toxin-like effect that is elicited by the infection with rotavirus, and that that can have an effect of damaging the nervous system that creates that nice movement of our bowel as it should be pushing things along. And so we are concerned that that could be another underlying factor of the pathology in rotavirus, as well as a hypersecretion. So those two things, inflammation, the nervous system doesn't work and put that all on top of our inability to digest and we've got problems. And those problems typically manifest in this particular way. And we're all probably very familiar with seeing these situations. Now, with the advent of the rotavirus vaccine, and that's all we used to call it, it's actually rotavirus group A, G3, that we have in our vaccine strain. And we've had that vaccine since the early 90s. And so essentially, we've really pushed off rotavirus as a neonatal diarrhea problem. But when we do see it in neonates, they are pretty unhappy. They can get very sick. You can see that they will go off nurse. They'll often colic. This is actually a colicky fold that's a little bit older. Because we tend to see colic associated with the much younger foals, sort of 24 to 48 hours of age, when we did at least the work uh, in Kentucky over the last two years, that seems to be the really the age that we see the, the foals that get colic as well. As you see here in the bottom left, uh, this is testimony to yes, it really does roll downhill. And then here we have a typical sample of that diarrhea fluid that we'll see with rotavirus. And you can see very watery and very profuse. And rotavirus, we have become very good at picking it up and treating these foals aggressively. And so it is not the sort of uh, devastating fatal disease that we always thought it was. But it is nevertheless a fatal disease. It's just that we've got really good at recognizing it. And farm managers, stud managers, veterinarians are very good at intervening and keeping these foals alive. And that's because we can offset that rapid and profound dehydration and electrolyte loss that comes with this diarrhea and maldigestion. And so we can support these foals very well through the, pro through the process that usually lasts anywhere from sort of four to seven or eight days, depending on the age, the dose, and any back background immunity that they may have. What's interesting is that we rarely see fever in these foals, or at least we've not noticed fever. Maybe we're just not taking it frequently enough, but it's never been documented as a viral disease that seems to be characterized by fever. So in 2020, we got two fabulous new virologists at the Gluckaquine Research Center. In our and in, in most industries where we are using vaccination, we don't tend to see neonatal disease with rotavirus because we are vaccinating those mares, generating immunity through colostrum and passive transfer. And so what we have been seeing though, is disease in these foals at about three to four months of age. And that's a little bit of an annoying age. You know, you're just starting to turn them out. You're turning your face towards prepping your yearlings. And then you get diarrhea running through your group of mares and foals out in the field. And what we found was that the vaccine strain was present in these outbreaks, the G3 strain, but we were actually seeing a lot more of the G14 strain for which we don't have a vaccine. We do see in these foals some significant dysbiosis and some of these foals can get really sick. Just to make mention, Japan has a slightly different variant of equine rotavirus G3. They have a G3A and B and they have, they have developed their own vaccine for it. And so we initiated a study and we, we recruited farms and we collected 100 and, uh, sorry, 1,931 samples of, of fecal material, 
serial blood samples from foals all the way through till they were four months of age, because what we wanted to understand was how the maternal immunity waned, whether there was a point of intervention where we could use the vaccine on foals, and what was the reason these some of these foals got really severe dysbiosis, because we will lose foals at this, at this age. And this is legacy work, and I need to mention here Dr. Peter Timoney, Dr. David Powell, and Dr. Roberta Dwyer, because they really set the stage for all of the rotavirus work um, and the delivery of the vaccine that we currently have, which is unfortunately only conditionally licensed. In central Kentucky, pretty much every single farm is using three doses of vaccine per the manufacturer's recommendations. And so at the beginning of the foaling season in 2021, we thought something different was definitely happening. What we were finding was diarrhea coming through in late January, early February, so quite unusual time of the year. We were seeing foals as early as 24 and 48 hours of age, the sweet spot being around three to four days of age. And the story on these farms was that they started off completely normally, and then after 10 or 20 foals, whatever it might be, every single foal was getting sick. Obviously, people were doing testing, as you would imagine, with this kind of a situation, very scary indeed. And Clostridium perfringens type A was currently being blamed at that time. Now, let's just take a quick look at that. We found on our diagnostic testing that they were negative for equine rotavirus A on PCR, coronavirus and salmonella typically. We saw some, but not all were positive uh, for Clostridium perfringens, and we also saw Clostridioides difficile. But at this point, we are seeing a very heavy use of antibiotics, not just for those that are sick, but when foals were born, people were dropping catheters and starting them on pretty heavy duty, broad spectrum antimicrobials. But that heavy prophylactic use of antimicrobials did not seem to change the trajectory of this disease at all. I wanted to just mention very quickly clostridial diarrhea because what we saw in our testing panels that was that we were positive for clostridium. But in actual fact, true clostridiosis is a situation where you can literally take a gram, you can take a little slide and just pop it against some feces or just uh, take a swab and rub some feces on. And you will see on that slide, the picture that we see here in the bottom left of the slide. Lots and lots and lots of gram staining uh, rods. Um, so they're gram positive rods. And this is a very classic thing that you'll see with a true clostridiosis. The other thing that we found that was really unusual is that clostridiosis typically produces a rather bloody diarrhea. The picture to your top right is of a foal that had clostridium perfringens clostridiosis in 2021. Um, they can be a little bit more loose in terms of more watery. But nevertheless, there tends to be this classic systemic shock. They, are, they have circulatory shock. They're extremely systemically sick. And the pattern of infection is not one where we see every single foal getting affected. That's quite uh, different. You'll see maybe several on a farm, but not every single one going like dominoes. And so when we look back in the literature, and this is certainly consistent with the data that we obtained from sampling uh, about 480 samples last year. We found uh, consistent with this study done by Dr. Tillotson and those people in Central Kentucky and at Colorado State University, where they followed 124 mares and foals throughout the last part of their gestation and as the foal was born up until a few months of age. And this piece of information is really important for us to remember because of those foals, all normal, 90% cultured positive for clostridium perfringens on day three of life, and that was their sampling day. So it's important to remember these were normal foals and they were C-perf positive. Now, over the course of the four months following these foals, 11 foals did get sick, but only one of them got sick, and that foal was sick with clostridium perfringens type C, which we all know has got sort of a bit bigger teeth than clostridium perfringens type A assuming you don't have the net F toxin. But important to know, we see Clostridium perfringens positivity in normal foals at three days of age. So where did that leave us? Well, it left us back at this beginning. We we're all saying, gosh, it looks a bit like rotavirus, except it doesn't test like rotavirus. These foals stopped nursing. They were depressed. They often get abdominal distension. 
they motile gut, especially in the younger foals, they're colicking. And of course, that's extremely concerning. Watery diarrhea, rapid dehydration and profound electrolyte and pH changes, low fevers. And that, that severe degree of colic and abdominal distension in a foal under, 12, any, under 24 hours of age is, of course, of massive concern because at that point you're wondering if you've got an, a congenital abnormality. So we'll often be throwing the ultrasound probes on these babies, and this would be a classic set of pictures that we'd get. Distended loops of small intestine because the gut is inflamed, it's immotile, nervous system's not working very well, the foal is not at all happy. And then when you take a look at the, at the uh, colon, you can see that it is just filled with fluid. And this is a foal with a distended abdomen. These foals respond very well to intravenous lidocaine uh, continuous infusion, as well as their intravenous fluids. But of course, they do need hospitalizing. And that means significant expense being passed on to our owners. So we were really, really worrying at this point in time. We had tried a lot of things. We were using a lot of antimicrobials, adsorbents, all kinds of different things, and nothing was changing the trajectory of the clinical pro progression. Our two wonderful virologists that came, I called them up on a Sunday afternoon about a week and a half into when we were seeing all of this. And it was hard to start with because people weren't really talking to each other. The farms didn't really want to communicate with each other. They had a problem. They sort of thought it was an isolated problem. That barrier has broken down this year. We've seen a lot more sharing of information, which is fantastic. And Dr. Lee just made my day by saying, just bring me some samples, Emma. So that wasn't a problem for me. Oh boy, did I have a freezer full. We had a situation where we were obtaining samples from lots of different farms. We had the, the espionage dead drops and I was tying bags of goodies and testing kits to trees because I didn't want to go on farms and nobody wanted me on their farm. I was collecting samples in flybys from isolation facilities. We had student workers volunteering to help. It was an absolute team effort. And to go along with that, our industry came up with the goods. We had some emergency response, response funds at the Gluck, the Kentucky Thoroughbred Association and the Kentucky Thoroughbred Owner Breeders Association gave us a significant chunk of change to get this work done, as well as gifts from Coolmore and the Grayson Jockey Club. So it is very much testimony that over three days, we rolled this out and had the money to do the next thing, which is metagenomic sequencing. Now, the interesting thing about this is that when we do testing on our fecal samples or blood samples or whatever it might be, where we're doing diagnostic testing, we're often culturing something or we're looking for something using PCR. But we have to know what to look for because we have to either know how to grow it, what conditions it likes, what it looks like, or we have to know enough about its genetic sequence to develop primers for that PCR test. So we have a very blinkered view of what we're actually going to find. And when those tests come up negative, we're left scratching our heads. So when we do metagenomic testing, what we're actually doing is sequencing all of the genetic material that might be in that sample, whether that's RNA or DNA. We separate out those, those um, genetic uh, sequences that relate to the horse, and then we sequence that material and we're blasting it against all of the known genomes that we have. So it isn't a perfect world. We don't have all of them, but it certainly helps. And the data drives the discovery. And so it looks a bit like this. We take our samples, we prep them, we sequence them. We have massive computers and very incredibly bright people who are doing the quality control and mapping to genomes. And then we ask what's different between the diseased animals and the normal animals. And from there, we get a relatively rapid turnaround. In our case, it was 12 days. We have a very sensitive technique. It's exquisitely accurate. And because we can turn this rapidly around, it's cost effective and we can reduce morbidity. So what is so important about going to all of these uh, when we know that we can help these foals get through the disease? What's so important about it? Well, this is a slide a colleague of mine, Dr. Alan Dalton, developed for when he was talking to us about using microchips, which we have found, by the way, brilliant. And obviously, this was taking place in the middle of the pandemic. So when horses... When horse people talk about coronavirus, this was the this was the scene that he came up with. This wonderful picture of Brad Pitt in the film Fight Club, and then this is what happens when we mention the word rotavirus. So finding our answer, 
was absolutely critical for people to get on board and really get serious about their biosecurity because biosecurity for rotavirus is really, really tough. A teaspoon of rotavirus, so about five, sorry, a teaspoon of rotaviral diarrhea, so about five mils, can contain up to half a trillion virus particles. And you only need 100 to 1,000 to infect a foal. So we have to get pretty busy with our biosecurity. So we rapidly, we produced a fast publication so that we could disseminate this information because that led to the creation and sharing of PCR testing for the diagnosis of equine rotavirus B because you absolutely need specific primers to be able to find it in your sample. We then continued that research and believe that we've identified a very similar virus in neonatal goats that had diarrhea um, in central Kentucky. And we're looking in other parts of the country um, because we do think this could be a, a, a virus that originated in goats. But either way, it's a ruminant origin virus. So that meant that we really had to get, uh, get our skates on with regard to biosecurity. And nobody wants to hear about biosecurity, but some of the things that we found very useful and then remember, we were having trouble getting PPE last year. But some of the things that were critical, because when we could say we had this novel rotavirus for which we do not have tools, for which we do not have a vaccine, the only thing you'll let, you have left with is biosecurity. And that helped people to really clamp down on foot traffic in the barn, particularly the foaling barn. It helped people employ techniques where we reduce contact with foals, between foals. Amazingly enough, leaf blowers, I'm not sure if they're used uh, widely, but leaf blowers are used to sweep the barn aisle and they are just a bioterrorist's dream because you're disseminating all of that organic material all over your barn, ensuring that every single horse has the best opportunity to get infected. We made sure that people weren't pressure washing barns when they were occupied and we made sure people weren't relying on bleach as a disinfectant. It will kill rotavirus, but only on an impervious surface. It is absolutely terrible in a barn situation with organic material. We encouraged people to use their equipment properly. And as you see here, this is a machine that has become very popular. They cost about $2,000 and they can help you in the barn. I'll just play a <laughs> So as you can see, that billy goat is, has become something that a lot of people have, have decided to use. Sorry. The biggest single thing that we found helped was that we were able to fall outside. Now, this is a tall order in Kentucky, as you might imagine. We were asking people to do this in the middle of March. We can have pretty nasty weather then, but I can absolutely assure you that nobody died of the cold. We didn't get any frozen off ear tips. Um, and it actually turned out to be very, very successful because it enabled people to have just one person dressed up for the foaling. The, fo the mares were quite a lot calmer. Some people would keep the mares in the stalls, in the, the foaling barn. And when they broke water, they would take them out to a pen. They would then stay in that pen five to seven days. Some people had them out all the time. It really depended on the infrastructure uh, that they had. And I think you're going to get some talks um, from a couple of our stud farm managers that really did a great job uh, creating good infrastructure. But this was a critical component. And what we did was we um, would do the day old fold check and I'll have a video of that. And then we would leave these falls alone but for between five and seven days, depending on our, our time frame, and then move the pens around because we didn't want to build up of any pathogens in there. But the mares were amazingly calm, really, really happy about it. Now, everybody probably knows Jerry Duffy. Um, he's one of my heroes. He's up at um, Godolphin Stoner side. And he and I made this little video because we had a lot of people that were very nervous about the, the pitfalls of foaling outside. And Jerry speaks very elegantly um, about how that makes a difference. And this has empowered a lot of farm managers to foal outside because they know how much pressure Jerry is under to produce optimally growing foals. And he didn't lose a single percentage point foaling his mares outside. So this is a little video where Jerry covers a lot of the concerns that we have. My name is Jerry Duffy. I am the farm manager for Godolphin Stonerside and Raceland Farms here in Bourbon County. Annually on Stonerside, which is a 2,000 acre farm, we foal 
anywhere from 55 to 60 mares and breed back about 80 with barren and maidens and so on. We rear their foals and, and yearlings um, to the point at which we send them out to the, the breakers and, and the trainers. So we started out the 2021 foaling season uh, as normal. We foal inside in a foaling barn. Every mare is foaled in the stall that they occupy. So we use all the stalls in the barn for foaling. We started the season pretty normally, uneventfully, outside of your normal um, foaling season mishaps or woes or so be it. Um, March of that year, we probably foaled about 20 mares and we started to get this uh, diarrhea in our young foals, typically 36 hours old. We probably were four or five folds in before we realized, okay, this is happening to every one. So we knew we had a problem. There was rumors that it was a clostridium issue. And so our first thing that we did was we decided we'd move barns and go to a fresh barns. There was handoffs, so there was zero contamination, we thought. And lo and behold, the first mayors to fold in that barn brought the problem with them. So we were probably at this stage treating 12 or 14 sick folds. We knew that it was a contagious issue, that it was being transferred from one to the next or mare to fold. We didn't really know how. And we talked a lot about biosecurity. And I came to the conclusion that, you know, the 100% foolproof uh, method of ensuring we had biosecurity was just not touching. So we started foaling outside. We did as little as was possible to the foals. We obviously dipped their navels. We did a rib check and pulled the blood the next day for the IgGs. Once they were okay, they went into a paddock and we didn't touch them for seven days. And that was the, the method we found that just broke the chain and broke the cycle and gave us a chance to, to sort of get ahead of it. By being hands off and just letting them do their thing, you realize that most foals and most mares, 95 plus percent, when they stand, they inevitably nurse and do just fine. I think previously we were trying to get in there and help them way more than they needed mm -hmm. and possibly upsetting things at times and, you know, taking more time than they needed. And um, so just watching them do things naturally made me realize how little help they need when things are going normally. As with any season, you're going to get a couple of ribs, you're going to get foals that are either quite contracted or quite laxed, and you, you treat the individual. Provided they're okay, they go on and they go outside, and that's that's good. You know, you go to a lot of farms and watch how they go from stall to stall and tend the foal and go to the next one, and it's a wipe and a tail and catch them by the mouth. It's a biosecurity disaster. And so with the thermal microchips, you eliminate that and again, instead of relying on temperatures exclusively, you can take a temperature very quickly and monitor nursing, well-being, other indicators which may be more important uh, than the temperature exclusively. We just basically put up poles and very small, you know, LED lights that were sufficient to light the paddocks. I'd say we spent $1,000 putting in that infrastructure um, and did most of it ourselves. What I will say is that from not only falling outside, but then in turn leaving them outside, the savings on straw, hay, labor are astronomical. I do know that our straw bill for the year will be 75% less than what it was last year, which is, a, you know, a very significant saving. The, the other big benefit is that instead of your team and your help spending a significant part of their day stripping stalls from barns full of mares and foals, and they can spend time with the horses and they can do other things. And just the morale and the, you know, well-being and happiness, you know, was, was uh, definitely noticeable around the barns. So we definitely made the decision that we were going to try and fall more outside and get them outside quicker. And what that translated to in 2022 was over 50% of our foals were foaled outside. The crop of foals we have is, is I haven't been more pleased with them in, in a long time. So 
I think the proof is in the pudding. I really feel strongly that our standard of care and our observation on how these polls were doing um, was possibly increased by having them out more. My name is Jerry. So that was Jerry, and obviously we really appreciated him doing that. And what he mentioned about staff was a really important consideration because we saw massive staff burnout last year uh, and, and um, with, with our veterinarians and staff on our, our studs. Um, so this is a very quick sort of video. It's just it's very short. It's of, of essentially what that looks like in terms of doing the, the one day foal check. So foal would be born the next time, the next day, the veterinarian, as you see here, uh, Chris Smith. Um, who is, uh, this was a video taken very kindly on, on Miss Jane Lyon's farm, uh, Summerwind, where Flightline was born and bred. And so they, uh, she likes to to, uh, to handle her foals, so it was very hard for her not to be able to get in there and handle her foals. But essentially, this is what that foal check looks like. And then these foals don't get touched for another six, uh, six days or so. So it's obviously PPE for absolutely everybody. Everything obviously gets done uh, first off when they get to these farms, um, disinfecting all of the equipment beforehand. So full check, IgG, CBC, whatever other blood work you wish to pull at that time, your insurance check, your general physical exam, checking for ribs or the presence of fractured ribs, I should say. And then one of the things that we really encouraged people to do was to employ the biothermal chips at day old, because whilst a lot of uh, stud managers felt very happy just peeking a, taking a quick look at that mare's udder to see if that foal was feeling okay, um, a lot of people do want that recorded temperature. And so obviously putting a, putting a microchip in these babies uh, at, at day one was a little bit unusual for people because it's such a skinny little neck. I, I am here to tell you that they don't go anywhere. We have done serial x-rays, Dr. Metcalf has, and basically this is what it looks like in terms of these foals are getting the chips on day one and um, checking the scanner. I don't even want to see that he doesn't have gloves on. So these thermal microchips became absolutely a wonderful tool with regard to biosecurity. And of course, you can imagine um, there's a great deal of discussion about them saving, uh, saving people from accidents as well, you know, being at the back end. A lot of people chose to go with the Equitrace app to keep track of these things. I have no dog in the fight. This is not certainly an advertisement for that, but it is just a way, at least in the United States, because we are way behind the eight ball with regard to microchip use, um, to capture those 15 digits with a name rather than the 15 digits. And we've seen problems there. So future directions, just very quickly. We are working extremely hard on three different platforms to generate a vaccine. We're currently raising money. Part of that's coming from the university, part from the KTOB, and part from stakeholders so that we can get a vaccine over the line. We are looking at a subunit vaccine and an mRNA nanoparticle vaccine. And um, the reason because we cannot grow, nobody has ever grown rotavirus B in culture. So that is obviously one of the easiest ways to generate a vaccine is you grow up your, vac your virus and you inactivate it. Hey, presto, you have a vaccine. Um, using a subunit vaccine um, that could be a chimera vaccine or an mRNA nanoparticle vaccine. Obviously, these technologies are way further forward um, after COVID. So we are able to piggyback on to that technology nicely. And eventually, we would very much like to be able to produce a multivalent vaccine that covers a, G3, and G14. There's a little bit of cost protection in the antibodies currently, but not sufficient to stave off for the whole of that foal's young life. And then a B. So we would have those three components, both of the rotavirus strains that we currently see and B. Now, in terms of where we see this virus coming from, none of the farms that we tested or have surveyed, and that's about uh, 300 at the moment, have goats on the farm. Some of the people that work on the farms may have goats, but we don't know exactly how it got in. We have identified this virus in the feces of mares. We don't know whether that's just a passage. We don't know whether that is them uh, giving it to their foal or the foal giving it to them. We're not entirely sure. We need obviously a lot more money to work that out. In terms of foal shedding, we do know that these foals will shed it for several days um, after they have stopped diarrhea. I've only done about 12 foals, but some of them can go up to nine days. The, the sweet spot is around about four to five days. And we are currently examining whether there is 
we can identify it in soil and water. But the big thing we need is a vaccine, and that's absolutely what we're going for. As I say, this is a teamwork. Um, we've been very fortunate to set up testing at most of the labs that we have anything to do with. Um, and now we have um, shared our reagents so that we've got testing. Um, we've worked quite a lot with Dr. the wonderful Dr. Anne Cullinan at the Irish Equine Centre. They were one of the first to get on board so that they have testing set up there for you all. Um, at Rossdale's, Alistair Foote and his team have been fabulous that it's set up at Rossdale's. They're now, they're now doing PCR for all of the rotaviruses that we can detect. We've got it at Newmarket Econ Hospital and we've set it up in several other countries. Um, and so, as I can let you know, it is most definitely a team sport. Um, there is a question here that says, is the morbidity and severity of rota B more severe than rota A? That's a very good question, Carlin. And the answer I'm going to give you is that we see rotavirus A as quite a nasty disease in unvaccinated, in foals born to unvaccinated mares. So it is still out there and it's all over the place and it can absolutely do just as many nasty things. We probably have a bit more background immunity in mares against rota A. Rota B, we don't have a comparison um, of, of severity of, of, of disease. So I'm old enough, um, and I know there's a couple of other people on this call who were also there in that day, in the days before we had rotavirus A vaccine, and we would see very, very sick young babies. So what I've seen of rotavirus B seems extremely similar, is all I can really say. We just don't have enough data to give you hard information at the present time, I'm sorry. Now, where I can send you to to keep you updated, um, we have two websites. This website here is basically the one that's going to keep you updated. So gluck.ca.uky and uh, Hannah can obviously send these slides out to you if you would like. We have a rotavirus hub where we have recorded talks from our rotavirus workshop last year, where we have a lot of stud managers talking about what they did and how they coped and things that they were uh, able to employ that helped. And then we have two publications, the Aquine Disease Quarterly and a monthly Aquine Science Review. And when we have research updates or new information, they will go out in those two electronic publications. And obviously all of this is free of charge as part of our land grant mission to serve our industry and our colleagues locally and, and internationally. Um, so with that, um, thank you very, very much indeed for the invitation. I'm happy to take questions or answer them uh, later by um, by email. Thank you very much, Emma. That's a, I find that an, an incredibly informative presentation, um, especially hearing from Jerry Duffy and just kind of, so it was almost the real world application of what it's like on those farms and what they're actually doing to manage this. Um, as Emma said, if anyone has any questions, um, you're welcome to either pop them in the chat now or what we can also do is unmute yourself if anyone would like to ask a question now. Um, and also, yeah, if you if you think of anything kind of after the the seminar, we can definitely pass those on to both speakers. Um, I suppose, am I from one of my point I was thinking as well, did you find any difference in the prevalence between 2021 and 2022? Or were case numbers kind of similar enough? That was the sixty-four thousand dollar question going into this year, actually. And so the so last year, I we surveyed farms, and about forty-five percent of the farms in central Kentucky had the problem. Uh, this year, quite a large number. We haven't completed the survey, but over the past two years, two thirds of the farms have had this issue, and we've identified farms in California, Louisiana, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and New York. So it's obviously in other places as well. Now, what we did see was we do believe that there we would like to think that this is some immunity that the mares developed from having a sick foal last year because we did identify, and I haven't finished crunching the data, I'll share it uh, later with you, but we did see that some mares that had sick foals last year had a grayscale of how sick those foals became on farms that had a second outbreak or where that mare moved to another farm that hadn't had the outbreak. So we believe that there could be some uh, immunity. 
that was picked up by those mares and came through their colostrum. We are currently testing that. No one's done any work on rotavirus for 30 years. So we actually had to develop the assays and we're just getting those worked out now. So we'll have those answers hopefully by the summer. And so um, it wasn't a slam dunk. We had one farm that was very, very badly affected both years and that was extremely frustrating. So we're actually developing some uh, hyperimmune serum products that we hope will be able to be used orally to protect foals in lieu of a vaccine currently. Um, so it's hard to know how much those mares picked up that immunity. So great question. It's a tough one indeed. Um, and I suppose on an international scale as well, obviously a lot of your research has come from Kentucky and America. And I know you mentioned Japan, you know, we're testing individually for rotavirus B, but have you seen any other outbreaks? I mean, a lot of people here are from a, a wide range of countries, mainly around Europe, but do you think it, it it's prevalent over here? Will it? Is it hard to say? It's just something people should keep on their radar. And That's a really good question that we don't know the answer to. Um, earlier this year, I was suspicious talking with a, a veterinarian from uh, the northern part of uh, the Republic of Ireland in your country there and we were suspicious but we didn't nail it down and that could have been just we didn't have the testing and the products have to be tested relatively quickly the other thing is we have evidence in in other parts of science that um, for example certain types of clay will interfere with PCR and um, those are the clays that we put in our adsorbent products so we are concerned we might not have identified that We've got our ear out in other places. We've talked to a lot of the farm managers, particularly with international connections, what this might look like, because obviously in the late 80s, when it was really, really bad before we had a vaccine, there was a lot more movement of mares with foals at foot. Now, of course, we see mares moving around much more in the winter pre prepartum from the sales. They'll be going to other places. So I don't know exactly what that movement is going to be looking like. We were very concerned that we wanted different countries to not only have the testing available so they could snap into it right away if they got diarrhea and so that they could identify it. But also those labs have now been, we are now asking them to collect samples for us so that we can keep an eye on what the genetic drift and shift of these different viruses are. Because when we make a vaccine, it means we'll be able to make it more adaptable. So I don't know the answer, but I don't think it's gonna stay confined. Exactly. Probably much similar to COVID. I know everyone's probably annoyed of hearing about the word, but we saw the spread, we saw the variations and it's probably, I think I suppose we're all familiar with it now and having something like rotavirus B on your radar is probably only good for the farms to be aware of it. Um, I suppose if no one has an, any other questions for Emma, it looks like the chat is all good. Um, we will probably then thank you very much for your talk and we will introduce next up Sharon. Um, so Sharon O'Regan is the general manager at Weatherbees and she will talk about the Weatherbees e-passport functionality and future plans for the technology. Um, Sharon is also a council member of the European and South African Studbook Committee and also a Studbook Regional Reviewer. Um, and we do actually have one question, I think, in Anne Cullinan, I think, was saying it tested all faeces samples this year and last year, and they're all negative for Rodan B. I mean, that's always great news to hear that it's, it's not anything yet. Um, but Sharon, if you are ready to share screen there, you will um. jump on over. Thank you, Hannah, and good evening, everyone. And I have to say, I found Emma's uh, presentation really, uh, really interesting. And I suppose it fits in nicely to what I'm going to discuss this evening, which is sort of digital solutions and the Weatherby's e-passport as well. So I think it was really interesting to get the update from Emma and what's been happening. Um, so, yeah, I'll just share my screen now. You all can see that. Yep, that looks all good. 
Perfect. Well, look, I suppose what is, I, I, some of you may already be aware of, of, of what the, the digital, the Weatherby's digital e-passport is, but I suppose just really quickly, it, it is the world's, I suppose, first digital passport and, and what we would class as the most advanced in that it does look at a single lifetime document for the animal in a secure platform for, for regulatory and legislative requirements. And that's predominantly relating to the four sort of class pillars that we would look at around our, our status as, uh, as a breeding program, but but also, you know, with the responsibility of identification for the animal. So we're looking at, you know, key areas like identification, health, welfare, traceability, uh, movement and ownership. And, and it would be what we would kind of class as sort of the, the predominant or, or key pillars in terms of, of animal information and the animal life cycle. I, I guess in terms of, of that data and those touch points, it, it really for us was all about how could we um, make sure that we link the, the animal's identification to a digital application and a digital tool that could be applied both, both on farm and for, for regulatory purposes as well. Uh, and indeed for, for what we do here as well with the, the, the administration of the breeding programme or, or the stud book. Is what most people would probably know as far. But it's all about, I guess, touch points and gateways and how can we use digital applications to integrate with those and capture that data and store it for the, the health and welfare of the animal. And I won't go into this slide too much in too much detail, but I suppose we do we do fundamentally touch those gateways and there is data that we currently could be capturing that we're not, or data that is captured but stays in, in, in the paper passport. And it's how about we, you know, how do we make that data more accessible, more centralised and more of a benefit um, for breeders, keepers, trainers, owners, and basically everybody in the industry or, or, or all the actors or people that would come in contact with with, with animals throughout their 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 life cycle. I suppose really quickly we we have um, got a, over two hundred thousand animals across Ireland and the UK would have access to an e passport, and they are capturing various different data points on that digital application at the moment across identification, health. So vaccinations predominantly, we, we've got a large number of vaccinations for animals, both historical and, and currently administered ones. You're talking about, you know, close to 150,000 vaccination records that we have a digital record of. Uh, and, and, and that's predominantly through the, the, the racing um, authorities for the IHRB, which is the Irish Horse Racing Registry Board in Ireland, and the BHA uh, in, in the UK. And we, we also would look to, to to capture additional information, not, not just vaccination, but obviously, as uh, Emma alluded to there, you know, one of the key areas that we're going to focus on in the next two years will be stuff like health, weight recording, um, video updates, gait analysis, all, all that kind of stuff. So it's a general health tracker. Tracker. We have some, some services available already and we hope to introduce some, some in the new year and then obviously across the next couple of years as well. You can update ownership information, which is really important too in terms of traceability and welfare of the animal. You can uh, identify, identify and, and, and submit notifications for key life cycle life cycle events such as as death as well and movement so we capture all of that data as well uh, in terms of the thermo chip um i guess and, and what the focus of this evening slides are, are going to be on in relation to the e-passport and where we are to date the, the weatherby's e-passport will will integrate with with all of the, the the standard iso approved microchips but using the thermo chip um, we look to capture information additional to that, so identification, GPS location, um, improved biosecurity, pre-clearance for farms, competition grounds, sales houses, all of that, you know, the, the combination of capturing all of that key life cycle events and health information uh, can be very can be a very powerful tool we believe to help improve biosecurity for, for the whole industry so it is something that that we are keen to progress and move forward with so just just some general information and i'm no uh, technical guru or genius when it comes to the the thermal chip but we we've been 
reviewing data and analysis from the industry over the last number of years. And we've been looking at the thermal chip itself since about 2017. Uh, the thermal chip combined with, with, with the microchip technology has the ability, obviously, to, to, to read temperature, record ID and other information. So there's all types of health information that you can capture um, as well at the same time. Um, and it has the ability, obviously, to read uh, between 33 degrees and 43 degrees Celsius. So in the new year, we will look to launch across Ireland and the UK um, the thermal chip and the aim will be to have every foal across Ireland and the UK um, with access to a thermal chip um, from, from, a, from a weather bees registrations perspective. So most of you may be aware of, but when you're registering your foals, you have to blood sample mark and microchip them. And we'd be looking to dispatch the thermal chip as part of that registration process. Um, and with that, then we would also coincide that with some further development of, of our digital WeatherBC passport to allow breeders, keepers, um, trainers, owners, etc., to capture that health information um, should they wish to do so. So it's quite simple. Um, we hope to go live with this early in the new year and it would basically just key in the date. Uh, you'd look to then just put in some simple information and the, the app would pretty much do the, do the rest. It would create a, a baseline temperature in the morning and in the evening, depending on how many times you wish to scan the animal and collect the temperature information. You could look at um, building historical record and view all of the temperatures previously, or indeed, if you want just a quick view and a graph, you could, you could certainly have that at a quick visual uh, just to track the health and welfare of the animal as well and and that surveillance piece i think which which um emma alluded to in in her presentation which is key as well then really quickly um this th this is just some similar to the previous slide just some information about capturing uh, weight as well which is something we'll we'll be looking to bring in in the new year um just, just a quick, quick overview of what that might look like again it's quite simple you create your your sort of standard baseline and then whenever you wish to take the, the weight of the animal again you could you could and look at the the average weight and the overall um in terms of its its, its key events as well so across 23 and into 24 we'll be looking at obviously look to increase um, and strengthen breeder engagement uh, on on all of the things that you can do with your digital passport and how that will look in the future we work quite quite closely uh, here and, and we're looking to have a really good relationship with 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 our department of agriculture and the people who drive some of these digital initiatives there as well and and, and it'll be about rolling out the the digital passport alongside the paper passport but sort of encouraging people to use it for 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 more and more things to help capture information and, and track information to make life hopefully easier for, for themselves and everybody else uh, improve ownership um updates and working with the sales companies and how we might integrate with them to make that a more automated process again it's it, it's key in terms of that traceability um and 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 welfare piece and we've been doing quite a lot of work with um the traceability strategy for 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 Ireland and working closely with John Osborne as well on that and making it a key part of, of their strategy so it's, it's all about information capturing data and recording it um in relation to the animal's life cycle implement the health tracker so that will happen steps of that in areas that will happen in early 2023 we're looking at as well as looking at recording laboratory test results for breeding stock i think that's a key one as well and we're looking to sort of advance in that across 2023 and have it in place for for, for 2024 update and record additional movements and keeper details so obviously we mentioned it earlier on about gps and location and that could be done either as part of your your thermal chip by scanning the animal and turning on your GPS location or manually adding in information as well there. If, if you didn't want to sort of do it as that automatic update, you can also opt in or opt out. Um, Bluetooth scanning, obviously with a the thermal chip, that is part of it. So it does work in, 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 in line with uh, Bluetooth scanning. So you have to have that enabled um, to work with a the thermal chip and the Weatherby's digital passport. And then also vaccination um, via data feed. So for, for certain manufacturing vaccines that we'd look to put a, a watermark that you could scan the vaccine that would automatically upload into your e-passport to capture some of that essential information. Um, so 
that sort of pretty much brings me to the end of my slides. Um, happy to take any kind of questions from the floor if everyone has anything or if, if there's any information anyone would like. Additionally, um, obviously you can pass it on to Hannah and I'd be more than happy to share it with you or answer any questions that you may think of uh, after the, the session this evening. Super, thank you very much, Sharon. Um, so as Sharon mentioned, we can, um, any questions can go into the chat there as well. Um, I suppose having a, a think about the app, it really is kind of a, a one-stop shop for kind of everything health related to your horse. Um, and I, I think it's kind of a no brainer that you want everything there. Um, thinking, I suppose, on the horses, the older horses that would have had older microchips, they would have had them for maybe a few years. Um, can you use this to check their apps or will they require a new microchip or kind of what is the, the thinking behind that? So we we would, that, that, that is a really great question actually. What we would do is we would recommend that you start from, um, you know, a, a year, a given year or a fall crop, certainly in relation to traceability and identification, the existing animal um, would have a, a microchip inserted and that would be linked to its passport. And that is a single lifetime document. So we wouldn't recommend that you'd insert the animal with another microchip, if, if at all possible. The idea would be that you start with the, with, with the kind of fall crop and grow from there over time. Um, obviously, the scanners would be completely compatible with the existing uh, chips inserted into animals, but they wouldn't read the temperature. You could record other health information, but they won't record the, the, the temperature for older animals. And uh, Emma has asked there, will each registration package have a thermal chip? Yes. So we will look across 2023 and 24. We won't have every um, we won't have the, the thermal chips rolled out for every foal um, for 23. But definitely for the 2024 foal crop, every foal will have access to a thermal chip. That doesn't necessarily mean that you have to engage with that technology, that the, the thermal chip will act as the standard normal chip does. So it will do that as a standard. So you'll be able to scan the animal, identify it and not wish to, to, to use it as a thermal chip or health surveillance, if that's what you wish. But if you do want to go ahead and have some benefits from the additional technology rolling out that that's animal surveillance and and general sort of health capture um, of the animal's temperature, then you can look to do that as well. You could that's certainly certain, you know, practice that you can introduce onto the farm. Marianne has asked there, will the paper passports be filled out together with the e-passport? And what about horses with e-passports going abroad? Will the new owners get access to the necessary information? So um we will still say that the paper passport for now until until um, legislation aligns is the primary document. But every foal born in, in, in 2021 and 2022 actually already has access to a digital passport. So the thermal chip is just the next step in that in, in that progression of that enhancements. But we have already started on that journey and we have got foals in 2021 and 2022 across Ireland and the UK that, that have their digital passports. Um, so yeah, every fall we expect from now on, every fall crop will will have a have a have access to it to an e passport or a Weatherby's digital passport. I think it's it's definitely new technology. It's definitely something that we're still learning about, um, and it's certainly something that that we're open to engagement with from from breeders and keepers and people who who will you know be interacting with it. It, it has to align with with legislation, but I think um, I think we have started that journey, and I think it's quite a positive one. So yeah, no, absolutely, I, I see it that hopefully over time we'll be able to introduce more and more functionality to make it more relevant for breeders and keepers to to, to kind of use digital um, applications to support them. You know, as as we sort of phase the paper passport out over over time, hopefully. I mean, it has got quite a lot of benefits in that. You know, you've, even now we, we've noticed it for for particularly for racing, if, if an animal's passport gets lost, we can 
issue now a duplicate passport with all of the historical vaccinations or at least what we have a digital record of it so that's been really beneficial and, th- and there's been some other really beneficial um, things have come out of having digital information available whether that's you know in, in terms of vaccine shortages which I think we, we were we were all sort of a little bit worried about earlier in the year and other information we could we could look at potentially when when those might hit or what the impacts might have been of those you know look looking at timelines and information. So I do think it, it, it the more we use it, the more benefits we, we see of it. Um, so that, that I guess, hopefully answers uh, answers that question. Was there another, was the second part of that question? I, I think, Hannah, I might have missed, was there? Jump, um, the horses uh, with e-passports going abroad. Right. So, yeah, look, at the moment, certainly we have got this pre-clearance, which I think is is really, really important maybe to highlight. And it's maybe something I didn't mention in, in my presentation when I was whizzing through it. But pre-clearance is something that we've done for vaccinations for animals. And we do that not just for those animals that are racing domestically, but we do that for animals that travel to the UK as well. So that pre-clearance for animals running. Um, in the UK is done before those animals ever leave Ireland and vice versa. Animals coming to run from the UK will will have their vaccines pre-cleared before they declare, actually. So I I think, yeah, look, definitely that is something we'd like to do for a lot of things, whether that's ownership, vaccination information and general health information, traceability, welfare, all of that stuff would be fantastic to pre-clear in the future. Even mares going for cover, whatever the case is, I think it's definitely something we look to implement is that pre-clearance at the moment as I said we have got it in place with the UK and we would look to to introduce it we've had conversations with France as well uh, in particular um in relation to sharing that data and I know they're working on certain aspects of of their technology as well but I definitely think it would be one for the future we're not there yet um that we would we would allow them certainly to have access to to the e-passport but it's just about keeping that information up to date um and and how and how difficult that would be we don't have full visibility of that yet but we would love to see it. even if animals move into other disciplines I think across across Ireland and the UK again for that traceability piece I think it's important that we could capture data that we may not have been able to before for animals that move into di- other disciplines so if they move, move out of the the thoroughbred racing and breeding industry certainly it would be good for a touch point if we could pick up information if they move into dressage or venting or some or just as a, a, a as a companion animal I think it would be great for us as an industry to say that we've got those touch points as well. Exactly, and it's the kind of traceability of the whole animal's life cycle. That's the important part of it. Um, what I might do is I'll take one more question. We've had a few more come in on the chat. They have all been recorded, so I will send them on. And if anyone else has further questions, if you think of throughout the next couple of days, please do send them on. Um, Sharon, one more question. Do you have to put the weights in manually for, uh, for each horse? the moment yes but we are looking to certainly integrate with certain types of weighing scales that that would be automatically uh, uploaded uh, similarly like 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 we are talking about the technology for for the thermochip that when you scan or the animal stands and scales there would be a feed that you could capture that automatically from but at the moment as a as a as a sort of a a starter or or, or initially making that available we are going to allow people to enter them manually but then certainly look at as we sort of roll out more and more enhancements that you'd be able to get gather more information automatically and integrate with, with different on-farm tools that people are currently using. So, yeah. Super. And I might just squeeze one more in. I think it might be short enough. Um, is there a lifespan for the thermo chips? No, no, definitely not. So we would currently with our own standard chip, we would have done a lot of market research around the lifespan of those. And certainly um, we've looked at the current chip and that's, you know, they say the average, you know, lifespan of an animal is about 35 years, I think is is is, is generally what's accepted and, and chips will last that. The thermo chip, we have looked at it and has been tested. So the manufacturer that we would look to, to, to partner with, um, certainly that has been tested. It's been, labor- I don't know a huge amount about it but it has been labor i've seen i've seen the 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 test files and the information coming back but it has been laboratory tested to prove that the chip is sustainable um and and will last for 40 years um so that's that's certainly so it's it's not a concern that we have in terms of the, the lifespan of the chip perfect um and will there be an extra cost to registration with the thermo chips no Um, and we might have time for one more. I'm just making sure we get everything here. Um, 
do our, the traditional chip readers read the thermo chips? No, the, the traditional scanners will, will only pick up the standard. With, it is Bluetooth, so you would have to integrate with with a Bluetooth scanner and a handheld device. So I can I can certainly share some more information specifically if people are interested in that, or I can add it maybe um, Hannah to yourself and, and and make it available. But there are certain types of scanners that mm-hmm. would be that that would be required to integrate with that because it is it is quite a a, a meaty bit of technology. It's, it works on Bluetooth, so your scanner would have to pick that up yeah there are various providers in the market i think as well for those scanners perfect i think you covered already is there a cost difference between the thermal chip and the previous chip there is a cost difference but it's not something that we would look to pass on to the breeders um, at this stage yeah um well look thank you everyone for coming i think that's most of the questions gone through on the chat there So if anyone did have any other questions, as I said, you can send them on to myself and I'll pass them on. Um, Special thanks to our two speakers, Emma and Sharon. It was a pleasure to have you both and hear about your presentations. Um, The webinar will be available after the event to view um, if anyone has missed it or if they came late. And yeah, thank you everyone for coming and I hope you all have a lovely evening.